from Southern California. Welcome to the Hour of Power. This week, Crystal Hansen, author of Pure Thoughts for Pure Results, Nita Whitaker and Lisi LaFontaine, the Hour of Power Choir, and Pastor Bobby Schuler as the face and voice of positive Christianity to the world. Is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I think about those words. God made today for us, and we can trust in that. Isn't that good news? Yeah. Turn around to those who are standing near you. Shake their hands warmly. Greet them. Give some hugs and high fives. Say, God loves you, and so do I. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you that this life is your life, that you care about us as your children. Lord, I believe that if we could understand that truly, that we're your kids, that you love us more than we could even love our kids or our grandkids. If we could really grasp that, I think our lives would be different. So that's my only prayer this morning, God that everyone who's watching on television and everyone who's here this morning would know, deep within the soul, that we're not what we do, we're not what we have, we're not what people say about us, we're your kids, your children. You're our dad, and so we love you, and we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, you may be seated. In preparation for Bobby's message today, hear these words from Mark's Gospel. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, 
and bless them. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. There is a
is really, really nice. I'm so thankful, Don and Choir and Jocelyn, thank you. Today it is my pleasure to welcome to Shepherd's Grove and the Hour of Power, Crystal Hansen. Crystal is uh, married to the popular author, Mark Victor Hansen, who we interviewed last week, who's here today. Hi, Mark, good to see you. And uh, he was speaking to us, of course, about his uh, world-renowned Chicken Soup for the Soul book series. Crystal's worked alongside Mark in the creation of a children's version of uh, Chicken Soup, which is cool because actually today we're talking about kids. Yeah. She's a certified life coach and helped thousands of people, curing them of messy thinking, which each one of us has at our, uh, you know, at one time or another uh, in our lives. And this messy thinking lies in everyone's subconscious and in their thought process. Crystal, good morning. Thank good you for morning. joining us. Let's give her a it's, hand it's and really welcome her. Really great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So, really what, is, what is messy thinking? So what happens is we all, um, from the time we take our very first breath, Bobby, we're, we're taking in all of these experience and experiences and events that happen in our life, and our brains, in, in their efficiency, record all of these experiences, right? We, we sure. make perceptions, and um, a lot of times those perceptions have inaccuracies or distortions or we delete information. But what happens is we set up our own neural network like a filtration system. So we start to filter the rest of our life by those programs that we have been put in our minds or we've accepted. Um, just things that happen, people around us, everyone's well-meaning, but stuff happens, right? Sure, and sure. so we build these programs sometimes that I call messy thinking. Because we, what, we look around at our lives and say, you know, this isn't working. I, I, I don't feel like I can have success in my marriage or success in my relationships with my kids or or success in my job, my career hasn't worked out, and we just keep sabotaging ourselves and wondering why, that's when we, we need to get to the bottom of it. And our subconscious mind is like a storage tank. It, yeah, right. it holds all these programs, and until we intervene deliberately, nothing really changes. I'm actually thinking it would be something like if I said, like, uh, I'm not good enough to do that, or if I said something like, um, I'm not going to tell a person that I'm frustrated with them or I'm not going to speak out against them. That's the kind of... Right, right. Because we have fears that we're not worthy, fears of rejection, fears that we're wrong, fear... So many fears. I mean, most of our problems in life are fear-based. And we all know that fear is really the enemy because it keeps us from expressing all that we were meant to be. I mean, we, we, have, we each have an important purpose in this life. Each person has a unique signature that they are here to do. And if our messy thinking is always getting in our own way, how can we ever become that full expression that God wanted us to be, right? Yeah. What's the, what's the most common thing that you see people kind of, when you talk about messy thinking, you sit mm -hmm. with people, you're coaching them all the time. What's like the most popular messy thought, I guess, would be it? You know what it is? I'm, I'm not worthy. Like, I'm not good enough to, be, to manage this company, or uh, um, I'm not lovable. So we do all kinds of things, all kinds of behaviors around this underlying thought that I, I'm not lovable, so I have to take abuse because otherwise I'll lose this love, or I'll have to settle for less, otherwise I'll lose this love. And it really keeps us from God, from being able to really download God, because this messy thinking that we have takes up a lot of space and a lot of energy in our minds and our hearts and our day. And so what the work that I do is all about clearing ourselves, clearing ourselves of all this noise and all this garbage and all this stuff that was put inside of us for whatever reason, from when we were tiny, that's, life just happens, right? right yeah. The more we can clear ourselves, the more we can say, you know, you know I like to say, make me an empty vessel for, for God to fill me because, you know, then we, we get the pure love, the pure intellect, the pure wisdom of God driving us, right, when we can get rid ourselves of all of those other things. It's interesting so. listening to you, I mean, especially as a pastor, you know, I, I, I almost hear you saying, like, it's really hard to overcome, I mean, you, you hear psychologists and stuff talk about the things you're talking about, what I hear right. you kind of saying is, like, faith is a really important part of overcoming, I mean, Kierkegaard, it was huge for him, but faith is a really important part of overcoming these subconscious things, these fears, this messy thinking and all that. Absolutely. Faith is everything. I mean, you have to know, people, people put too much power in what happens in this life yeah. instead of putting the power in God and, and, and having that faith that you can absolutely overcome everything. You can shift anything. I've, I mean, addictions, I've had people who have literally gotten over addictions, 
Um, I had a woman who came to me who severely abused her whole life. She woke up every day wanting to die, um, feeling like she, sh she had no right to live, like she shouldn't be alive. She, her mother had, you know, was mentally ill, left her when she was 12, then her dad abandoned her. She was passed around to family members like a Cinderella, in a Cinderella role, and she yeah. said, I, I literally woke up every day thinking I had no right to live, I should just die. And she wrote me an email after four sessions and she said, I can honestly say I am totally free of the crushing depression I've experienced my entire life. And I just thank God. Yeah, we don't have to carry any of this stuff. That's my message to people. I just, I see people as these shining, you know, beautiful um, expressions of God, and, and it's kind of like we just need to scrub off all that junk that we've all taken on so we can shine, let our light shine the way they're supposed to. You're really writing a lot now about uh, like weight loss and personal health and things yeah. like that, and I think a lot of people would ask, well, what does weight loss have to do with God or with faith right. or with your mind or these things? Isn't it just like right. eat better? And, and how do you respond to something like that? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because but we have to really recognize that um, one of our greatest gifts is this body temple we were given. I mean, if we don't keep this body temple healthy, how will we ever become the greatest expression? If we're, uh, if we're gonna, stuck in sickness. I'm going to interject and, here because I know a lot of people, when you say body temple, yeah. like a lot of people think like that sounds kind of weird. But really, that's a, that's a biblical phrase. I mean, that's what Corinthians says, that we're exactly. God's temple, right? Yep. I mean, what is it, Corinthians 6? Yeah. Yeah, your body is your temple. And how else? Your spirit is here to do your work, do your expression, become who all you're, you're supposed to be. Um, how can you do that when you're fighting disease and illness? And it's all preventable. But what I found is, you know, people are spent, we're spending $65 billion a year on weight loss, and people are heavier and sicker than ever. And it's, it goes back to that mind thing, the subconscious thing. People are very disconnected from, you know, their bodies. They, a lot of people just shove food mindlessly in and, and poor quality food. And it's really about connecting and honoring um, this gift of our bodies. I think it's very, very important. It's, it's something we need to pay attention to. And I just feel like the way people are doing it, I could see a breakdown because most people who came to me for weight loss were really somewhere in their mind expecting the fat person to come out again. So they would just do this roller coaster dieting which takes a lot of energy and, yeah. and depression, and there's a lot of emotional residue, and there's a way, just like every other problem, to free yourself from that. You know, there's a lot of people probably watching on television or in the audience today who are struggling with weight or some of these different things, and they're looking at you right now and they're hating you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you're pretty, you're skinny, you know? Uh, and, and, like, I mean, you know, what do you say, though? I mean, to, it doesn't, isn't there a part of this, there's all, kind of a cycle to it, isn't it? I mean, like, like you feel like you feel overweight, and you, you you talk yourself down, and then you see somebody else yes. talking about weight loss, and like yes, what exactly. You, what do you say to and like first that? of all, I want to say that you know we're not all supposed to look exactly like we're all different body type styles. So my program is called Skinny Life, and it's the real skinny on healthy, young, and fit, and that's what it is. The bottom line truth, because we're not all supposed to be the same size, but what we're supposed to do is is become aware of how to take the best care of our body. And it yeah. all starts with the mind, that mental programming, like the awareness, what foods do what in my body so that it can have health and fit and, and uh, you know, longevity so I can really feel good to do the work that I'm doing. Awesome. Well, yeah. I, I'm, I hope that people check out what you're doing because I, <laughs> I know that what you're doing is holistic. It's not just about losing weight and looking better or something not like that. It really is a spirit. It's a... It's a part of the spiritual journey and the soul, and, and I think what you're doing is really great. I, I want to encourage our viewers to really check out some of the things that you're talking about. I, I think it's a big help. And, uh, and, you know, there's millions of people listening around the world. Right. You know, there, if you had just, like, one thing to say to them, what would that one thing be? I would say that, you know, you have so much power inside of you, and so don't let the events that have happened in your life shut you down and control your life. You can go into that quiet space. It doesn't take really any help other than just asking God to be present, but we, we, we live in a noisy word so, world, so go into that quiet space and, and, and pray, but then listen, you know, that's what prayer, we talk, and meditation, we listen, listen to what God's telling you, recognize some of that subconscious programming that's shutting you down, yeah. and saying, I'm ready to be free of that, free me of that, empty me, 
I'm, I'm ready to empty myself and do the work that I was made to do. Everyone has that power inside of them. You don't have to be miserable. You don't have to carry those things. Right. Her name is Crystal Hansen. You can get her book on our website or online. And uh, really, I really want to encourage you guys to check out some of her things. And Crystal, we're just so thankful. And you're going to be around to sign books and meet everybody yeah, afterwards. Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. great. So Let's give her a hand that. and thank her. Thank you, Crystal, so much. Thank you. God bless thank you. you. All the best. We so appreciate you. And now we're, we're thrilled to welcome back Nita and Lisi. So happy to have you guys. Uh, thank you guys for being here. And uh, let's give them a hand, Nita and Lisi Levantine.
Hello, I'm Ed Arnold, a proud volunteer here on the Hour of Power. This ministry continues to see miracle after miracle of lives being saved from hurts and depression. And we believe with rock solid conviction that folks everywhere need our positive televised message to help and encourage them during tough times. You should know that we also need the miracle of your financial help that allows this hour of power to reach the world each week. We are here to support and lift you, your neighbors, and those you may never meet with a message of hope and healing through this weekly televised worship service. Your gift today truly bonds us in a partnership of love to reach the world with God's love. As a token of our appreciation for all that you do so that the Hour of Power ministry can continue its weekly televised mission, we will send you this beautiful and encouraging pearl cross bracelet. This one size fits all pearl bracelet with a shimmering gold cross is truly a spectacular gift to wear as a reminder of Christ's love for you and the essential help that you provided the Hour of Power today. You may also want to share this bracelet with a special friend or loved one. With your generous donation today, the Hour of Power can and will be on the air, bringing you what many people consider the most inspirational hour on television week after week. We're asking for a gift of any size. Call, write, or go online and request your Pearl Cross bracelet today. The address is Hour of Power, Box 100, Garden Grove, California, or call toll free 1 866 Get Hope. That's 1 866 438 4673. You can also go online at hourofpower.org. In Canada, the address is Hour of Power, Post Office, Box 9050, Surrey, British Columbia, or call toll free 1 866 581 7654. You can also go online at hourofpower.ca. Thank you for watching the Hour of Power and for your ongoing generous support to help keep the program on the air. Now, let's return to the service. When I think I'm going under, part the waters, Lord. When I feel the waves around me calm the sea. When I cry for help, oh, hear me, Lord, and hold out your hand to me, touch my life, still the raging storm in me.
coming. We love you. Great. Today, uh, we're going to talk about children in the next generation and investing in the future and believing in who's coming up. Now that, this is an important thing because in order to think this way, you have to be selfless, sacrificial, and loving. Uh, the reason I was here late today was because my, uh, you know, pastors are not often late to church, you know, but my two-year-old son who has all sorts of health problems was throwing a fit this morning, and so we, we just had some, some challenges, and, and yet, uh, that's okay, isn't it? That's what matters, right? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. I, uh, it's, I, I planned this message a couple of months ago, and what I didn't realize is that this week I would have the kids all to myself. I think the Lord somehow knew that. Uh, Hannah has been at uh, a clinic for, uh, this week, and so I, I worked during the day, and my mom and babysitters watching the kids, and then I would have the kids all afternoon, all night to myself, you know, after four or five or something when I'd get home. And so I had the opportunity to sort of be thinking through my sermon as I'm watching my kids. And there's something about children that's good for the soul. Something really, something about children that's really, really good for the human heart. You know, whether you have kids or want kids or you're married or that's your thing, we need children. We need them around. We need them in our lives. And they need to be the most important thing. And what I don't want to happen today is I don't want to give a sermon and many of you are not called to have kids. It's not what you're supposed to do. Many of you, God called you to be single or he called you to never have children. And I want to say that that is a good thing. Paul was in favor of that. I mean, Paul told some ministers, don't ever get married, you know? So, so there is something about not having kids. And the last thing I want you to do is walk out of the sermon and feel like I'm saying everybody needs to have lots and lots of kids. Rather, what I'm saying is that children matter and that no matter who we are, we need to think about investing into kids, into teenagers, and into young people. All right? Are we, go we good there? <laughs> don't begin with this. There's a really wonderful, and I, I wish this was written uh, over the Senate in Washington, D.C., but a wonderful Greek proverb. It says, a society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they will never sit. That's nice, isn't it? And that really is what I'm talking about here, and that really is what the kingdom of God, what Christianity is and should be about. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus does something a little strange, and I'm going to just read it to you. Mark chapter 9, verse 33, it says, they, referring to the disciples, they came to Capernaum. When he was in the, in the house, he asked them, what were you guys arguing about on the road? And it says here, but they kept quiet on the way because they were arguing about who among them was the greatest. So Jesus is walking along and his disciples are essentially saying, I'm the greatest. <laughs> no, I'm the greatest. And back and forth they went. This is not uncommon, by the way, in a sort of Greco-Roman hero, idol kind of world. You read their epics and it's all about being the strongest, the fastest, the richest, the tallest, the smartest. And so as Jesus is walking, they are all, his disciples are saying, I'm the smartest, I'm the best, I'm closest to the Messiah, I'm the greatest. And so Jesus, hearing this, he sits down and he, he calls the 12 and he says, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and must be a servant to all. I mean, it sounds quite normal to us because we're Christians, but that was not normal when Jesus said it. He took a little child whom he placed among them and taking the child into his arms, he said of them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does, uh, does not welcome me, but welcomes the one who sent me. Okay, so they're arguing about who's the greatest. Jesus takes a child in his arms, and he says, essentially, if you want to be great, you got to be like one of these kids. Okay, now a few hours goes by, they're doing this and that, and in Mark chapter 10, uh, they're talking again, 
and Jesus is preaching or something. In Mark chapter 10, verse 13, it's a famous passage. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. They're very normal for a prophet to bless or touch children. But the, the disciples rebuked them, rebuked the children and the parents. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. Now, he had just finished telling them, invite children to me and into the kingdom of God. Now here, hours later, they're rebuking children and rebuking parents. They're still in that mindset of, I'm the greatest, I'm the best, I'm better. And in this passage, indignant or just kind of rebuking them, it's very, very likely Jesus is shouting when he says this at them. Shouting. Let the little children come to me. He's angry and frustrated because they didn't get the memo. They don't understand that in the kingdom of God, Jesus cares about children. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Not only does Jesus say that in order that, that little children ought to come into the kingdom of God and that children are favored in the kingdom of God and that, and that God loves children, but in fact, if you really want to walk and be like Jesus, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you actually have to become like a child. And when he says this, I mean, in the Greco-Roman world, it's, it's shocking culturally. Children are not the greatest. In Jesus' day, in the Roman Empire, children were property. And they were leased, and they were not valued, and they were ridiculed. Children were abused, neglected, exposed, sold, raped, unwanted. Children... In those days, we're not models of religious and spiritual depth and maturity. They were property. They were like cattle. What Jesus says is, is shocking. And yet he says, you've got to become like one of them if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember what it was like being a kid? That was awesome, wasn't it? Being a kid was so great. Anything could be anything. A stick was a sword. A trash can lid was a shield. That's if you're a boy, I guess. Maybe some of you girls were that way, too. Very cool. I remember all the time we had this space by our house. We called it the wild side. What it meant was it was the other side of the road, and there were some bamboo and trees over there, but... To us, it was the wilderness, it was a forest, and it could be anything. When you're a child, giving is different than it is when you're an adult. You don't think about a tax write-off when you're a kid, do you? You don't keep records, you don't. You just give, and you share, or you don't share, but there's really something about children that when they give, they sort of just give, and they love, and they hug, and they trust. That innocence and purity and, and, and really about the, this lack of worry is something that we lose as, as, uh, as we become adults, isn't it? And although we're not supposed to become childish, God calls us to be childlike. And how can we be childlike if we're never around children? You see, when we love on children and we hang out with children, we remember somehow what really matters. There's something about being around kids, loving them, caring for them, mentoring them, investing in them, that gives you a sense of hope and gladness and joy. And it, and it just, it can't be done through something like a book. It, you, you, you have to experience it. Loving children helps us understand what it means to be a childlike, godly person. And it also helps us to understand how God views us. He does not take you seriously. I just wanna throw that out there. God really doesn't take you that seriously. He loves you. He cares about you. But he's not worried. And the things we, we think are so huge, he's, he's got it sorted out. 
And I sometimes think of the things I worry about, like being late to a meeting or stuck in traffic, or I just think that that at the very least brings a smile to his face somehow, like it does when my kids complain about a toy not working. So Jesus' idea about how to love children, invest in children, changes world history. Because that view becomes a central piece in the early church. Famous historian, I think he's from Norway, and I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but I'm going to guess. I think it's Bach or Bakke. B-A-K-K-E. He wrote an awesome work called When Children Became People. He writes how in the Greco-Roman world, there was infanticide, exposure, pederasty, all of these things sort of happening Children being used, utilized, abused, neglected, unwanted, especially girls. You know, if a, if a, if a man had a girl, a baby girl, and didn't want her, he could just leave her out in the woods. No problem. No problem. Totally legal. Nobody even looked down on you for that. I'm telling you the Greco-Roman world. And so when into the Roman Empire... Christians come in and they go out to those woods and they grab those unwanted baby girls. And when they go to these children that are being abused and they rescue them and take them to monasteries or churches and hide them, God begins to bless the church. The early church overcomes historically the Roman Empire with kindness and compassion, especially to unwanted sick people, to, to old people who are also often neglected, and especially children, because children had the center place because of these stories and what Jesus said and how he lived. Children had the, the primary place in the early church. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just like having children, but spiritual children as well. The, the church very much believed in investing in young people and mentoring. The whole idea of a godfather or godmother, that came out of the church in a time when orphans would be abandoned and, and could even die if their parents were gone. Well, the church created a system for that. Godparents, they agreed. A, a brother in the Lord, a Christian would say, brother, if you die, I will raise your children like, like I am their father. They will inherit my estate. I will care for them. I will watch over them. And they, everything about the church was built about investing in children. Judaism was this way too. They, they so wanted their children to understand the gospel. You know, in Jesus' day, every child around the age of eight or nine had the first five books of the Bible memorized. That's awesome. They said, we want to stuff our children with Torah like you would stuff an ox. They just, our faith is about investing in and loving children and mentoring and caring for others and blessing the next generation. Okay, why do I say all this? Because I see that our world is becoming more and more selfish and less interested in tomorrow. Uh, many of our Viewers are in Europe, many of you have been to Europe. You can see that the, the statistics about Europe are staggering. That as Europeans have stopped having children, you know, that, and then immigrants come in and have lots and lots of children, the, the, it is very possible and, and even likely that in 100 years there may be no European language or culture. Um, I think some of that's even happening in the States. We're people have just sort of stopped having kids or, or they're not interested in kids or not interested in investing in kids or in mentoring or being big brothers or, and you just watch as, as God seems to be blessing the cultures that are having children and caring about kids. That's the way of things, I suppose. P.D. James wrote a book called Children of Men and there was a film loosely based on his book in which he talked about in a novel, like what would happen if we couldn't have kids anymore? If nothing else changed, we just couldn't have kids. All hope would vanish. And he talks in the story about how like women can't have children anymore if you watch the movie. But he, he says, 
It was reasonable to struggle, to suffer, perhaps even die for a more just, a more compassionate society, but not in a world with no future where all too soon the very words justice, compassion, society, struggle, evil, would be unheard echoes in an empty air without children. There's something about kids and and knowing that there's a tomorrow that makes today have a meaning. And so many of you, you've got a great job. You're making lots of money. You're succeeding and you feel lost. You have everything in the world you could ever hope for, but you feel lost. It's time you begin mentoring and investing in a future. I believe that so many people who feel hopeless is because they're not com- connected to a bright tomorrow. Listen, the church has a fantastic future if its people believe in the next generation. If our people believe in helping others. There, there's this thing, a scientific theory called the cha- chaos theory. Chaos theory is sometimes called the butterfly effect. And it's this idea that and it's a weather idea, but that the flap of a butterfly's wings in Alaska under the right conditions could cause a tornado in Texas. It's very possible that the very the little things that you are doing today, whether good or bad, that well after you're gone are going to continue to have an effect on history as time goes on. It is very possible that someone like Stalin is the result of one bad thing one man did to another 200 years ago. Uh, It is very possible that Mother Teresa is the result of one good thing that one person did or said to another person 500 years before that. The things you do today, especially with young people, teenagers, children, uh, the things you do today uh, can make a huge difference, especially dads. I just want to talk to dads for a second. You know the lowest attended church day of the year is? If you said Father's Day, you got it right. Mother's Day is the second most attended church day of the year, by the way. We all know what's happening, right? The moms are like, we're going to church. It's Mother's Day, you get dressed and get in the car. (laughs) Right? And we know exactly what happens on Father's Day. It's like 9 a.m., you can already smell the charcoal burning outside and the, the game is already on and the beer is in the, you know, the little bin and It's Father's Day. It's my day. We're not going to church. (laughs) Am I right? It's really unfortunate. Focus on the Family released a study that said fathers who go to church regularly with their children, those children are 92% likely to go to church as adults. Most of the things, like people look at like prison and all of these other things, all these staggering statistics, and you see that so much of it is related to fatherless households. And a lot of these households, it's not, it's not always that the dad just abandoned. Sometimes the fathers, you know, there's cancer, there's war. I mean, dads die. Um, and, and there's all sorts of reasons why you have children that don't have a father figure in their life. We need more men, more men to be men, to lead, to mentor, to invest, to be big brothers, to be uncles, to be godfathers. And even kids who have dads need other guys in their life that they can talk to in a way they can't talk to their dad. We need more manly men in the church to help raise our boys to be godly men of God, all right? Amen. And the other thing is that young people need the blessing from the older generation. They need it. I've spoken to this before. You cannot, you cannot underestimate the power and the need of the blessing of the one generation to the next. I think so much of the cultural revolution of the 60s and all of that stuff that happened was the builder's generation inability to bless the boomers. There is so much that is still lingering from one generation because of culture, because of long hair, because of its style of music, that one generation, when kids were growing up, 
They rejected and judged and pinned and did not have the ability to say, I bless you and I love you. It's amazing how much that blessing makes such a huge difference. The next generation needs the blessing of the older. Not just the affirmation, not even acceptance. The blessing, the encouragement, the support, the love. Too many dads are, and, and sons are competitive with each other. Too many moms and daughters are competing and jealous of one another. Each generation needs the blessing of the older, needs it. Think about what Jacob did to get the blessing of his father, Isaac. He lied and connived and put fur on his arms and pretended to be Esau and changed his voice just so he could get his father to lay his hands on his head and say, I bless you. That's a real need. I think so many of the problems from young people in prison to gangs to drugs to abuse to, to suicide has so much to do with a disconnection from one generation to the next. Every church and every Christian should be about blessing the next generation. That, that, that should be like half of everything we do. You look at churches that bless children and believe in children, those are happy, growing, thriving churches. Am I right? I'm thankful for Jeff. We started, you know, our team started here. We had a handful of kids and all this mess. We've got like 80 kids now on a Sunday, which is, which is good. But but it's not enough. It's not about, cre I'm not talking about creating a children's program and it's not just that. I'm asking you, especially for those of you that have never had kids or your kids are out of the house and now you're golfing every day and you're having a good time, stop being, don't be selfish with your time. I mean, have fun, relax, enjoy your life, but you should be mentoring and investing and blessing the next generation. You should be looking for young people, teenagers, uh, people in college, helping them find a job, helping them succeed in a career, helping them know, know what it means to be moral, good, Christian people. We need mentors. We need people investing in children and in young people. If you believe it, say amen. amen. Okay. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we're listening to you. And God, we're asking that you would help us always to know what it means to mentor, to love children. Some of us have biological children, and I pray that those children would always be first in our lives, our grandchildren, children, some great-grandchildren. But for those of us who don't have children, I pray, and even for us who do, I pray for spiritual children, that we'd be, begin to prepare our hearts to be mentors, to bless and to invest in tomorrow. Let us be a church and a society that plants trees in whose shade we know we will never sit. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, friends, for being here today. We're so glad and hope you leave blessed and encouraged. 
for all of you, for all of you watching on television, we, we are so glad that you invited us into your home today. Write to me here at the church. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, like us on Facebook and Twitter and all of those uh, cool things that uh, young people do. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here today. We're going to have ministering elders here um, that would be happy to pray with you for everything or anything you need. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember to write, call, or go online today to request your Pearl Cross bracelet. This one-size-fits-all pearl bracelet with a shimmering gold cross is truly a spectacular gift to wear as a reminder of Christ's love for you and the essential help that you provided the hour of power today. You may also want to share this bracelet with a special friend or loved one. We would love to send this Pearl Cross bracelet today as our ministry gift to you. The cross is the symbol of our faith, and we want you to always remember that God does love you, and so do we. We're asking for a gift of any size. Call right or go online and request your Pearl Cross bracelet today. The address is Hour of Power, Box 100, Garden Grove, California, or call toll-free 1-866-GET-HOPE. That's 1-866-438-4673. You can also go online at hourofpower.org. In Canada, the address is Hour of Power, Post Office, Box 9050, Surrey, British Columbia, or call toll-free 1-866-581-7654. You can also go online at hourofpower.ca. Join Hour of Power and Shepherd's Grove Friends for a journey through the Holy Land, November 10th through the 18th. Led by Pastor Bobby Schuler, you'll experience the Sea of Galilee and the Mount of Beatitudes. You'll also visit Nazareth, Bethlehem, and Jerusalem. Walk where Jesus walked. Don't miss this trip of a lifetime. For information, contact John Charles at 1-714-622-2952. Thank you again for watching the Hour of Power and for your ongoing generous support to help keep this program on the air. Please join us again next week and remember always that God loves you and so do we.